Hello ladies and gentlemen, in this video we're going to review everything we've talked about in, since the last review, which is pretty much some variations of loops and how to be a little bit more fluent in them. So you can find this up on my GitHub, at Caleb Curry, and you can go into the Python folder and then go into Beginner Python, and this is called 07 More Looping. So I'm just going to copy this, paste it all in our editor, and go through it. Do you need help advancing your coding skills? Check out my new program, Code Breakthrough. Code Breakthrough offers hands-on learning with Python and data structures, algorithms, and interview challenges. With a supportive community and regular new content, Code Breakthrough will help you get hired or advance your career. For a limited time launch special, use the link in the description to get 20% off your subscription. See you there! You want to make sure you have a pretty good hold on all of this information before we go to the next section. However, this is going to be a little bit different than everything we've talked about, mainly because I don't do the examples exactly as they are in my notes, I just use the same principles. So you might see a few other variations or a few different things in these notes. However, the principles stay the same, so you should be able to understand fairly well. So let's just run through this and go through everything. So the first thing we talked about was break, which can be used to break out of a loop. And this is often used if you're going through the loop and you only need to go a certain amount of times into the loop and stop when something is found or some condition is met. So for example, if we're looking for Python, what we can do is we can iterate through the language list and we can print if the item is found and break out. And Python is the first element in this list, so immediately it finds Python, prints Python found, and breaks out of the loop. Things in the same block of code after the break never get hit. So if we put this print here, you can't see me, is never going to execute. However, this print here will execute because it's on the outside of the if, and the if is only hit on occasion. So if the condition in the if statement evaluates to true, the break is hit and nothing left for that iteration executes. However, if the if does not evaluate to true, then anything after the if will be printed or executed. So in this situation, we're looking for C++, which is the second item in this list. So for that first iteration, it's going to print it's John Cena, which is the exact output we get. The next iteration, C++ is found, so it says C++ found, and then it breaks and nothing left is executed. Continue works in a similar way, except it's only going to skip to the next iteration and not break out of the loop altogether. So the example given here is that if we're searching for Java, and if you look back at the list, Java is here, and what is gonna happen is it's going to print that and then continue. That means this print statement down here, it's only going to be executed when that continue is not hit. So for every other language, it'll hit this print, but for Java, it's not gonna happen. So we have searching for Java, and then it says Python, not what we're looking for. C++, not what we're looking for. Java found. Perl, not what we're looking for. C sharp, not what we're looking for. An alternative structure for this is to use an else within the if. So we can say if language is Perl, then we can say it's found, otherwise we can say it's not what we're looking for. So that's why we have this other one, searching for Perl. We get these here, and then eventually Perl is found, and it continues the search. C sharp is not what we're looking for. All right, so that's enough on break and continue. I'm kind of sick of talking about those. So let's move on to the next thing, which is how to do nothing, which sounds a lot cooler. So if you want to do nothing, you can say for x in range 10, pass. It's gonna do absolutely nothing each iteration. Why would you wanna do this? Well, this is the equivalent to a to-do, which is pretty much saying, hey, we're gonna implement this later. So you often see to-do in comments, like to-do. In Python, if you have to put something there in order for it to run, such as indented within a loop, you can just put pass. You can also use this for classes and when you're defining your own functions. You may also see this for a busy wait, which basically just keeps your processor busy for a certain length of time or a certain number of iterations. The next thing is using else within loops. So we have one with the for loop. If we have the else here, it's going to execute no matter what, because we're not hitting a break. The only time the else isn't gonna be hit is if we hit a break. So we get it outputting all the numbers, and then it says, done. In the case of a failed search, we could say, nope, if nothing is found. So we're searching for the language Alabama in our languages list. Obviously, it's not in there because it's a bunch of programming languages. So we get, nope. Next up, we got while loops. Here is a situation where we count from zero to nine, and we get that output right here. So that's how you do that with a while loop. You can see the three pieces, the initialize, the condition, and the update. Those are the important components. 
and you can customize it however you want. So for example, you can start at 30 and count down. So that's going to look like this, and it's counting by twos, so you get 30, 28, 26, all the evens down to zero. Next up, we can convert between a while loop and a for loop, just to show you that either one is fine. So we have the three components, the initialization, the stopping point, and the increment. If you do it within a for loop with a range, it's gonna look something like this, where you have the start, the stop, and the increment, or the step. With a while loop, it might look a little bit different, and it's a little weird with the variables here, but we start with a variable, and while it's less than some stopping position, we're going to do something, and then we're going to increment that number to progress in the loop. To make them match perfectly, the update should come at the end of the while, because this stepping here, this happens at the end of the for loop. Another thing to know is that when you're passing a variable to the range, the variable is not affected. So we, we pass in this initialization, but then we use i to actually use the number within the loop. So initialization is left at five. Next up, we have an else with a while. So we're looking through these numbers. Once it's done, it says else of while, which kind of is useless, but it shows the point. Here we get that output right here. And then we just have some random other examples. So the first thing is we're gonna check if a number squared, anything up to the value 10, is greater than 50. So the first one that is big enough is eight. So the way this is set up, we're basically setting a cap of how many numbers we wanna check. We wanna check up to 10 from zero, not including 10. And the first one that is large enough, we want to finish with that and break. We're literally counting from zero to 10. If you really only cared if any of the numbers are large enough, then you could start at the other end and save yourself some time. But we're specifically looking for the first number that is large enough, so that's why I started at zero and counted up. Here is the example of a flag variable. You would want to do this if you're not comfortable with an else after a loop. So you set, in this case, we're set, this is a good example because the previous examples in the series, we were using Boolean flags. In this situation, we're using a, an integer flag, so negative one, and it's gonna stay negative one until told otherwise. So if any of the numbers squared are larger than 500, what we're gonna do is we're gonna update this index to whatever position that is at, which we can use later on. This coordinates to this output here. Uh, this was for the first one, but now we're on this one, and we get none are big enough because we're only checking up to 10 exclusive, and none of those squared are gonna be larger than 500. So we basically check that flag later on. If the index is greater than negative one, then we can print that value. Otherwise, we just say none are big enough. So that is how you would do a search and return the index. This is just a concept, just to be clear guys, a flag variable is a concept. There's nothing new on syntax, you don't have to do a special flag variable or create it in a certain way. It's just a variable that we're using in a certain way. Next up we have a setup for a do while loop, which again, there's no concept of this in Python, but we can implement the same thing using a normal while loop, where in this situation it's going to print i at least one time, and in this case we're incrementing it, then we check to see if it's under 10, and then we do it again. So there's a little bit of code redundancy as we talked about, however it does get the job done, and it's going to print 15 no matter what. So to generalize this, we do stuff, we check to see if we wanna continue, and then we do stuff again. So we can use this structure or the other structure for a do while loop to create a, an indefinite loop, and in that situation, we're going to continue indefinitely as long as some condition is met. So if the response is y or lowercase y, then we can continue forever, because it's in a while loop. So do you want to continue? Yes, yes, and it's gonna keep asking us. If you wanted to flip this so there's no code repetition, then what you would do is you would say while true, get the person's response, and if the response is not y, then you would break out of that loop. Ooh, I'm hungry. I want chicken fingers, ah, sounds good. Careful again with the variable names, don't use continue or in, because those are keywords, so don't try it. And here's some vocabulary, a sentinel value is just a value to stop a loop. So if you're going and you wanna stop when you hit Q, then that situation, Q would be known as a sentinel value. Next up, we got upper and lower, which can be used to make our code a little simpler. So we can just check for lowercase y by using response.lower. This is an example of a method, which is just a function attached to an object, in this case, a string called response. 
It's important to understand as why and why are not the same thing. Overlooking this can introduce logical bugs in our software. Logic or logical bugs meaning that the code runs, it seems to work, however in certain scenarios it doesn't work and you don't see them all the time because you might be practicing and testing it using a capital Y and you find out, oh the lowercase y is broken or whatever it might be. So we want to avoid logical bugs as much as possible. There's also an upper, so this one it's asking am I screaming and that's going to pop up, let me show you, right here am I screaming, it's in all caps. And there's also a way to check, so you can say is upper, is lower, or else mixed. Caleb is not uppercase, it's not lowercase, so we get mixed. So I'm actually not too sure when you're gonna need to check uppercase or lowercase, but it's still good to know that that exists. So that is all the review of everything we talked about in the last 10 videos or so. Make sure you understand pretty good everything in this, and that'll help build the foundation for the next section. All right, peace out guys. Please be sure to subscribe and stay tuned because we're gonna get into some more complex and exciting stuff.